Welcome to the Life Career Roadmap channel. And today we have a special guest. We have Eliana Duarte coming from where you come from, Eliana. So uh, thank you very much for coming, for joining me here. And welcome, Eliana. Eliana. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emma, for the, for the invitation. <laughs> yes, welcome. I was uh, very curious to know more about you and about your uh, journey uh, migrating uh, to different countries. And I'd like to introduce you, but I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and, and where you come from and what's your professional background, Eliana? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I was born in Colombia. Uh, I lived there for 20 years old. Uh, for 20 years and then I just decided um, I was studying an occupational therapy diploma that is my first diploma that my first uh, like touching in, in, with the university then I started to work in over there for five years on the file of occupational health and safety mm -hmm. and then I just realized that it wasn't um, I, it wasn't enough the knowledge that I that I have over there about the ergonomics so I'm a really kind of citizen of the world. I really, it was a really good excuse to know in other countries, but also studying and growing professionally. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just uh, found a master's degree in France in ergonomics. So mm -hmm. everything about like modification in workplaces, etc. So I went there and doing my master's degree. Uh, I wasn't expected at all to stay in France for such a long time. Um, and the first year it was um, normal university and the second year it was an internship. Um, and after I ended the internship, um, it happened like this. They offered me a job position as ergonomics coordinator. So I was like, okay, well, let's do it. I don't have anything in Colombia. I can stay here in France. Uh, and they give me the opportunity uh, to start to have my first uh, prof ex professional experience uh, abroad, not in Colombia, etc. So it was like, that was my first experience looking for a job or looking for an internship. That's the mm -hmm. moment uh, in France. Uh, even even that period of time, it was more difficult for me because uh, even I was studying French, I I got um I was studying uh, the in the university, uh, but I just feel like uh, and it took me like almost three months to find my internship, even if I have that experience. So well, then after they allowed me to do the internship with them, after they offered me the job position as ergonomics coordinator, I worked for them like almost six years. Uh, and then um, professional crisis that I got, I just say, okay, I just need uh, a sabbatical year. I need to change. I need to, to, to change what I'm doing. Probably what I'm doing is not my passion. Probably mm -hmm. I have to like do something different, and that's the reason why when I while I was in France, I just certified myself as life coach. I started to help migrant girls, etc., uh, with their professions. Uh, and then I was like, okay, uh, I have this. I can go wherever I want to the war in the war. I have this that helps me uh, to have a source of money. Uh, let's go to another country. A change of uh, of everything and it was two possibilities Canada or Australia because I got the French nationality um, so I came here to Australia uh, with a working holiday visa and I was like the idea was only one year <laughs> and then after I didn't know like I was like okay let's surprise myself after I'm going to figure it out what is going to happen after uh, but I just realized that I just fell in love with Australia. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, and I saw that I, I went to the workshop. And the first thing for me that I realized though that day and the, through the workshop, it was like, as I have a working holiday visa, the first thing that I have to do is the, my farm job. Um, and after that, uh, if I want to stay in Australia forever, um, I have to go to use the car as uh, my ex professional experience. And it was really interesting because 
um, in this GR that I was outside of my file, I, it was something I realized there was something inside of me. That is my passion, to be honest. Um, I was working as a housekeeping, some housekeeper, something that I had never done in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and even over there, I was like proposing to my manager, let's do some uh, pre-star stretching, how we can improve the work conditions, etc. And that moment I say, oh my gosh, <laughs> I think this is, this is something that I like, but it's, it's something that now I'm missing. So I did the three months uh, working in Rodness Island. It was beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like paradise, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it was really exhausting, like physically uh, for me. I wasn't used to that uh, at all. And then after that, um, I just uh, I say, OK, this is the moment. If I'm going to stay in Australia, if I want to stay to Australia, let's do it. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try. Just just try. And and I remember that even in July of the last year, I saw an offer and I was like, I was an assistant offer of health and safety. I was like, okay, let's go. Let's apply. Just try. Just see how it happens. The interviews here in Australia, etc. And they called me. Uh, but they say, You're, you have a really interesting profile, but it's your visa. Your visa, we cannot help you with your visa, etc. And in that moment, I was really afraid about my visa. I was like, okay, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but then after I just focus on my farm job, um, and... And I just, after that, I, I say to myself, <laughs> I have, April is going to be the month that I'm going to focus on finding, and finding like the professional job that I need this offer to get through, to pass to the migration process. Mm -hmm. uh, April is going to be like my second job, like finding that, that job that I, that I, that I need to get to the process of my immigration process. Um, so I say to myself, like, <laughs> I give me myself a deadline. Okay. Like, if in 10 interviews that I got, I don't have nothing, that's it. I just, okay, I love Australia, but that's it. I That means that I, that's it. I just, I don't know, it's like a sensation of, okay, I will try my best, but if it doesn't work, I just give it up and find mm -hmm. another way. And I put 10 interviews like this for me. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. And I got two interviews. Um, it went really, really well. Mm -hmm. But I, it's, it, it has to be a lot of, like, um, self-confidence. Um, and a lot of, yeah, it, there's a lot of self-confidence in, in that process, to be honest. That's right. Let's see. You need to show that you are there, uh, that you know how to uh, contribute and how to you can help with the company, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go back. It's very interesting. I come back to these 10 interviews, but I want to go back to the beginning uh, when you said uh, coming from Colombia. Which part of Colombia are you from? Bogota, the capital. Bogota, the capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you did your, your degree there. So when was the time that you felt that you wanted... Um, move or going to know another country or to study in another country when did you realize that you want to do that well um it was a moment i went to europe uh to do a like a, a road no other trip a tour with my mom etc and we were in paris um there's i just know the moment the exact moment okay. <laughs> uh, even even before that, before that. But that moment I prefer I prefer that moment and we were like walking through Paris and my mom told me and uh, we were in passing through a university uh, I think it was the Sorbonne University and she told me can you imagine yourself like studying here and I was like whoa and I really like to study I'm an eternal student <laughs> um, and then it was like 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, like something inside of me, yeah, I want this. I want to study and I want to study abroad. Uh, it was something, that moment, I just take the decision uh, because before I have the opportunity that my family works in um in Avianca. This is a Colombian uh, uh, airline. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I traveled a lot when I was little. Uh, and when I was like 18 or something like that, I went to the University of Florida uh, and the Department of Occupational Therapies, etc. And I was over there. I just say to myself, like, mm -hmm, that will be interesting to study abroad outside of Colombia. Mm -hmm. So when then when you decide to do your master's degree, mm -hmm. um, you went, did you know French by th that time or you learned no. French? Where you go? How do you, because <laughs> the French in France, they are very uh, more, um, the language needs to be French, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how it's was for you? Exactly. So for me, it was like really uh, all preparation for that project. It was a project. Um, I was working. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working in a company back in Colombia uh, from 8 to 6 p.m. And after that, going to my, my French classes mm -hmm. from 6.30 <laughs> yeah. to 9. So I was leaving my house at like by like 6 30 in the morning and arriving at uh 12 no 12 no uh 10 o'clock in the evening mm -hmm. yeah. a long day a long yeah. day investing the time to learn and to practice your uh, your skills to be able to be there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and and then uh, arriving in in Paris one thing is going as a tourist and imagine yourself studying there. So arriving uh, in France, going to uh, Paris to to study. Mm -hmm. What did you find? What are like? Of, I imagine you were very excited. But how was this process of arriving and realizing now it's a reality? <laughs> oh, it was difficult <laughs> for me. Uh, I think that that thing that I passed through that experience make easier my experience now here in Australia, because um, after the three first months in in France and in Paris, I just came back to Colombia, <laughs> and I say mm -hmm. to my dad, really, yeah, it was really hard for me, um, because I wasn't expected at all to not have the possibility to work. Uh, I was counting with that money, um, but when I just arrived to the master, they told me that it's going to be Monday to Friday, eight to five. <laughs> no chance to do anything unless you do hospitality. Exactly. Yeah. And I was living outside of Paris. It was really difficult to find something uh, inside of Paris. Uh, so it was possible for me to work. So... Um, what we have to do with my, my mom is to find a credit with a Colombian bank. But through the process, I was without, I was without money. Uh, I was like, no eating, <laughs> no eating, literally. I was eating uh, rice and chicken, <laughs> uh, going to university. Um, I was living in, in a university, like, I don't know how they call it here, but with another uh, people who, who study in the university. Yeah, they yeah right? exactly yeah and it was not clean at all so all my basic needs needs wasn't like fully completely there for me mm -hmm. so and um, the masters and uh, the master was really really hard uh i was um, i was having Physics in French. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> I believe in Spanish was not even easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. My gosh, I was remember that I only understand like 60% of the courses. So it was really difficult for me. And I just feeling a part of all of them. Uh, French culture is so procedure that even if you get into a new place, you have to say, Good morning. And if you don't do it, it's, uh, it's rude for them. So I didn't know all about these cultural uh, traditions. 
and I was feeling that it was like me. It was me who were doing bad things. So it was me who were doing wrong things. So I was bad. So I took it really personal, all of this. And I just, in December, I, went, I, I, I left Colombia in September. And in December, I was coming back uh, <laughs> and saying, probably this is not for me. This is too hard um, economically, emotionally. Everything is too hard. So that helps me a lot to like have more energy. And I say, no, Paris is not going to win me. No, I have to do this. And I, I have, I'm going to at least the first year, at least the first year of the master's. And then you come back. Um, and then I come back uh, to Paris with no money. <laughs> it was different. <laughs> you could like, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Breathe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was like the first year it was I, I passed through. The second year it was better like financially because I was in the internship. So they're getting me paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I was continuously struggling, to be honest. The master's degree was really, was really, really, really hard. But I, when I finished it, I was like, oh my gosh, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't believe, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And, and this, a cultural aspect because um, despite despite France um, has also the roots in the Latin language and having Spanish that we can like as Portuguese we can understand a little bit of France uh, French as well. But how was for you as you said not having the awareness that you should have say have said uh, good morning every morning to to be able to connect with people so. Through the, this, when you came back, could you then um, develop relationships that you you felt more part of the community or part of the university or even doing your internship or you still feeling that you are, you were isolated? Um, it was that was my part part of um, through all my experience and years that I was in France, I was feeling isolated until the last years so to the two uh, last years it was feeling i was feeling really isolated um because um for me it was really difficult to understand the culture even after six years living there um so i was feeling really really isolated uh my friends were mainly uh, mexicans <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of mexican people really? over there yeah, I, know <laughs> I miss them. I miss the Americans <laughs> here. There's not a lot, but yeah, in in Paris, there's a lot of Mexican, uh, and it was my mainly my my many friends. So, yeah, I was. It was a uh, feeling that I got a lot in France: isolation, as um, loneliness. Uh, it was difficult for me, uh, even more when I get into the professional file because it was in the automotive industry. So it was like more masculine uh, side. And I was the only uh, foreign girl, <laughs> woman. Uh, so it was really, really, really difficult. But this experience, professional experience in, in, the, in a masculine uh, industry helps me a lot to develop a lot of resilience, a lot, a lot. I think that uh, universe God put me there to find myself again and to get uh, to pass through this professional and personal crisis um to to develop and to know myself better and the person be the person who i am today mm -hmm. yes and and i believe um, reading your your linkedin profile when you uh created the amor sin fronteras mm -hmm. uh that is in a Professional and spiritual expansion of Latina women who have migrated to United States, Canada, Europe. So tell us more about this. So was through your experience going through all these uh, hurdles that you had in, in in France that you had this aha moment that you could help others? Was that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, basically what happens to me in my personal life, of course, it started to impact my professional life. So as I say uh, all the time, it's like, it's different when you get uh, a divorce or a breakup. 
when you are living abroad uh, is totally completely different when you are living it in your in your in your uh, country. So it, what happens to me? I I passed through through a break and a divorce uh, in in France. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like. The only thing that I got, it was my professional life, but that also started to be impacted. Um, so it was a really period, uh, hard period for me, personal life, and get COVID arrives. And I was like, okay, the life is asking me to stop and just to realize what I really want to do in my life. So um, it was a, a personal a healing process that, I don't know why it wasn't not at all my my goal to find my purpose, but it just happens. It just happens. I was like, okay, probably there's a lot of girls that is struggling with their couples. That's the reason why they call Amor Sin Fronteras, Love Without Borders, because at the beginning it was focused like, probably for me what happens is I didn't understand him and he didn't understand me, my culture. So it was a cultural shock that impacts our couple so i start to do like interviews to couples uh multicultural multicultural couples to understand what is going on with them what what is their difficulties etc and i was doing a blog so i'm more in front as i start to be a blog and i realized doing the interviews that all the girls they're having this the same issue problem with the professional lives they weren't. They weren't feeling uh, like with a meaningful on their lives. Uh, they they were having problems to to get the homologation of their uh, their profession in, into the new country in France. So that impacts into their lives, of course, in emotional sense. So I was like, okay, okay, that's interesting because well, I have a background as occupational therapist. Occupation for me is really important. If the person doesn't have a minimal, a meaningful uh, occupation, is going to impact another area uh, of their lives. Yeah. Exactly. So it was like probably, and I know uh, about like workplace well-being. This is perfect, and I get passed through the process as migrant and as a migrant girl. You know what? I'm going to do something. <laughs> Well done. So you, you you went to the wellness, got your your background, your patient uh, therapy and health, mm -hmm. and see this. And especially uh, working with occupational therapy is uh, people that have been injured in the workplace and not being able also not just in workplace but not being able to come back to their occupation that they liked before what they want to do because they have been doing this for so long and it's, it's traumatic when you have an injury uh, uh, in the workplace right so uh, and you help people to uh, to recover mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to come back to them and it's very interesting that you said helping these girls to realize uh, that their uh, profession or their um, careers are affected by not being able to work in their field uh, in, in in where they were in a different country. Because normally what I, I see with my clients is the same. And I tell them, and I, I, rem I believe you remember when I, I mentioned this in the workshop, it's not the job that you want. Right, it's not the job that will make you happy in the new country. Yet, do you not the job that you make you feel that you are part of this? But it's how you feel contributing to where you are, exactly. because the job is not difficult to get, but a job that is um, is not meaningful, or you cannot go ahead. You feel that you still are uh, empty, searching for something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not just for the case of migrating and getting a job to solve the problem the problem can the job can become a problem exactly yeah yeah and is that this the the more of them have the feeling of useful i don't think useful uh i i'll probably i'm going to if uh, i want to feel like i'm helping or not helping like doing something probably i'm going to find a job like hospitality etc a survival job as you say i remember so much that, that, that <laughs> survival job i remember so much and i was like no i don't i want to i don't want to survive my job 
and and yeah so it's like it's really important to find like different um the sense that we get to the to the job that's that's really really important that is our job that job is not going to make you happy but what it is going to help you to feel that you are going to contribute into this new country and it's going to allow you to have the feeling of belonging yes and then we you embarked also in helping people with the um putting together the occupation uh, with the spirituality yeah right exactly. so tell me more about this yeah so well latinas and there's a reason why I, I i work with latina so um it was something that i realized uh myself uh all this process this crisis that i got in france um i was like really really far away from i don't call it religion because i really don't like to call religion i prefer to call it the spirituality mm -hmm. and i was really far away from the main spirituality i just get it off of the main spirituality but <laughs> again <laughs> occupational therapy came into the place <laughs> yes. I, I say that my 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 career occupational therapy is like saved my life literally um because it allows me when i'm back into the COVID, i uh, get into routines uh habits because i wasn't with jobs I, I, we were like a stop at everyone so as i say oh okay what i have to do uh, to get in, improve my like to continue to have a well-being habits and routines okay let's do it and in occupational therapy they say that there's a model uh for people who get like, migrants migrant people who just change etc and they say that in the center there is a spirituality if we can as occupational therapists and the person believe in something doesn't matter the religion is going to help in the process of adaptation mm -hmm. so when i saw that i was like and it's interesting because now and in this crisis i just start to feel my closer to god uh i and just like human beings starts to in this moment when you are really really down just start to find to looking for something bigger than you that help you can come to help you and you see the difference <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah and you see the difference between like when a person believes doesn't matter in what doesn't matter the religion etc and another that is like that's it i just that's it i don't believe that something else is going to help me or help me something that is hope that's the difference there's hope and this little thing is going to motivate me to continue to move to okay. through the, the process so for me is what really helps me in my terms of develop my spirituality uh so i i with the girls doesn't matter the religion mainly is latina is mainly is a uh, christian etc uh just to focus how in my daily life even if i got the job or not how can i continue to connect to my spirit my spirituality which habits i'm going to to implement in my life to connect with my spirituality and to continue to have to grow on me this feeling of hope mm -hmm. Okay. Because when you migrate, there's a lot of incertitude. That's right. So you felt the loneliness, the uh, isolation, emptiness, you know, despite you had a job working and you felt that I'm not mm -hmm. from here, I don't belong here. So, yeah, the, the sense of disconnection that you had to believe in someone else or in something else to be able to connect with yourself. So, the, mm -hmm. got it. So, uh, the other thing then is the moment when you said they had you had the um the professional uh, stuckness mm. right so it's realized well i did my master i am here working uh, in this um professional field that i chose but i don't feel like as i am very productive that my life is moving forward so tell me more about this stuckness moment the stuckness that you had the moment that you felt stuck Oh, it was really hard because you don't know by where it start. Like, uh, what happens is go is like normally what you try to do is to avoid that. So I was like, 
asking for days off and and even I remember yeah exactly and even I remember moments that I was going to my work with that sensation and really like really bad sensation in my stomach I didn't want to go I I really don't want to go over there and it was uh, now that I have passed through uh, I realized that it wasn't that bad to be honest but That moment you felt that way. Yeah, exactly. For me, it was the end of the war because in Latin America, and I think everywhere in the world, it's like your success depends on your career. Where are you at? So I arrived to this moment where I have everything. I was working in a multinational company. I was coordinator. Uh, I was traveling a lot with the credit card, corporate job, etc. So I'm supposed to be happy. But I'm not. I'm the completely opposite. So what I have to do, I need help on this. Mm -hmm. But it was really difficult to understand or to identify that I needed help. That's a one point, right? Is identifying or realizing that we need help because in many points in life we need help, but we think that we can do everything by, ourse by ourselves. And the other thing is to uh, ad admitting that we we are in a moment, that we are in a very low moment that we need help. And especially moving to a new country, you have um, the direct and indir indirect um, pressure that we need to perform well to yeah. show that we are well. That's true. Right? That's true. So it's a lot of energy drained putting that up yeah or if they need to show that i'm fine so mm -hmm. and then um you decide to go somewhere else yeah i decide to find help I, in that moment is when i found the life coaching <laughs> in that moment is when i found the life coaching and somewhere like uh, i saw it on facebook a girl who who grows like I'm a Mexican. I'm living in France. I'm helping engineers to uh, refine themselves in the careers and etc. Something like that. And I find I don't know how I found her. And I send her a message of like, hey, I you know I need your help. Um, probably you're going to understand me because you were living here in France you're Mexican you know what exactly what happens to you and you you pass through okay I'm not an engineer but I'm working with engineers I'm almost an engineer so I become an engineer I don't know how I was coming from a uh, humans science and I just arrived to design and, and engineers and stuff so I'm almost like engineers uh, an engineer please help me and it was the moment that I decide to be like coach having a coach for myself for three months we were together with her good and then you decide to also uh, immerse yourself in the study of being becoming a coach mm -hmm. exactly that was the moment that was the moment yeah and it's a very beautiful field right so uh, we learned so much about ourselves first and how we can help others so it's it it's very uh rewarding yeah a lot. a lot <laughs> and then came the aha moment to say hey i need to get out of here and you go somewhere else and then you said before it was between canada and australia so canada you would have the advantage of having the french <laughs> that in canada it's a bit different the french is not the same there but you could communicate right <laughs> but then australia far far away <laughs> <laughs> why was that <laughs> Yeah, I got these two options because my age for the working holiday. Um, I just like say, I, you know what? I already, I have the possibility to come back to Europe. I have a French passport. I can come back. It have uh, things. I'm just going to be one year over there. And then I come back going to work in Spain uh, or, or like in Portugal, whatever in Europe I want to be. So I got these two options, Canada and Australia. And finally, I decided to choose Australia um, because um, Canada, I just I just feel that cloudy 
<laughs> and it's now only here. So cold. <laughs> yeah, no, I could not. I will be so sad over there. So no, I was like, and you saw never in my mind because there's a lot of people that are here in Australia, like, oh, Australia is my dream, etc. For me, never, never. For me, it was France. Uh, and I was like, okay, let's try Australia. And in that year, I was like, coincidentally, I get I get to know another a lot of French people who just came here and do their working holiday, and they just come back and they were like, oh my gosh, I miss so much Australia. There was a lot of romanticism about Australia with the French people. Yes. Uh, so I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's go to Australia. They say that there's a lot of money over there. <laughs> there's the mines, I don't know. La, la, la. I was like, oh, okay, you know what? It's, it's close to Bali, it's close to Asia, etc. So that's the reason why I choose Australia, beach, chill, country, and I choose Western Australia. It was not the other side for me, it was Western mm -hmm. Australia. <laughs> right, then you came to do your work, uh, hol uh, holiday work visa, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then yeah. you did three months working uh, where? In the farm? Yeah, in Rodness. In, in, as a in Rodness, place. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, in Rodness. And then we spent the, the three months in Rodness. And then uh, what happened next? So then I was like, oh, okay. Ah, well, um, I, I I arrived the last year in June. Um, two months after, no, one month after even. <laughs> because friends give me this possibility, like, you have to, like, we have a lot, of, a lot of knowledge about migration process, etc. So I was like, even if I'm not going to stay here, let's let's see what what possibilities you have for me, Australia. Show me what what you got. <laughs> 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 so I just came with a, a migrant agent, and he told me like, with all the experience that you have in the file at Health and Safety Advisor. Um, you can do it. You you can apply for a skilled visa, etc. But you need a job offer. And that moment, I, I was just arriving. I was like, no ways, no, 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 no ways, no in my head. No, I just get out of that. I don't want to come back again. I was like, no ways. Okay, thank you so much, la la. But that stay in my head. Then after we got the the workshop, I was like, I was starting to fell in love with Australia. I was like, oh, I like this country. Uh, the quality of life much better than in, com in compared to France, etc. So then I get again and uh, like a personal one-to-one -one with the migrant agent. And I say to him like, okay, ma, I just say, Australia, if I have to study again, sorry, I'll let you. <laughs> I, I give uh -huh. it up with you. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we broke. <laughs> we broke up. Um, no, no. I don't. Uh, he told me that I don't need to study. I just need to validate all the experience that I had. So I was like, okay, let's do it. You know what? I'm going to try. With this sensation, it's not. I'm not like oh, I have to. Do it. Like I'm going to try. It's okay. It's okay. Like relax. Like really relax. Mm -hmm. But I knew it in my inside of me that it will be so easy for me the process of finding a, a professional job. So I ended my days in in April. Yeah. Yeah. No, less than that. In Mars. I ended in Mars. So I was like, April is the, the month that I'm going to focus on finding the job. It's going to be April. Mm -hmm. So I was, I just organized my... I, I'm really organized person. So in I have an app that I put all my applications, what I apply, etc. And I start to find what could what could like me. Because I, I was like looking like health and safety advisor or like I don't know. I don't know if I really do like that, etc. And I don't know how. Uh well, I know how kind of because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how. Um, it was also love without her borders. Amor sin fronteras that helped me, to be honest. What happens is that as in my LinkedIn, I put occupational therapies. I didn't put like founder and CEO of love without borders. I put 
like years like go occupational therapies in working for myself in love without borders i just changed location western australia la 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 oh my gosh they start to send me a lot of message we need we need occupational therapies and there's opportunity that are like are you registered with afra and you're like no i'm not registered sorry sorry so like oh my gosh that is crazy like they are looking at a lot of occupational therapies interesting etc and before arriving to australia i was like in love with my career because it's so rewarding occupational therapies is a mm -hmm. it's a real career that is really rewarding um so um on that there's an ad I, and i get it like ah compensation work compensation etc hmm, that's interesting workplace rehabilitation mm, that's interesting and i just start to follow the pages on linkedin and try to connect with people on the ah that she and they work in that area ah, engineer management mm, interesting rehabilitation consultant what is that ah, interesting okay let's see mm, okay and um, but that was before starting to apply so then i start to apply and then i saw an, an ad of a company literally for me <laughs> literally it was, the ad was written for you <laughs> yeah exactly but literally for me was well, like are you in a working holiday visa in australia oh like what <laughs> 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 what are you talking to me <laughs> uh -huh. and it was a girl at london it's an england girl etc uh, no i just i'm occupational therapist and i'm a working holiday visa here in australia i start to work in this company la, la, I was like, and this is what i do i help people who get injured in work etc i was like oh my gosh this is the moment to come back to occupational therapies and I saw the the, num the the name of the position and it was like, okay, rehabilitation, occupational rehabilitation or could be vocational, vocational rehabilitation, the rehabilitation uh, consultant, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I know where to go. <laughs> uh -huh. And I found like com two companies, two companies do like that make part of a big company. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like I, I was like I put an alert, an alert in LinkedIn, and the moment, the way how I did to find the offers is like, once I ended my job in Rodness, the day through the day, going back to my house on the bus, it was the moment for the scrolling LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was stalking LinkedIn. <laughs> Looking everyone in there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's stalking my ex. <laughs> uh, and it was the moment that I just seen offers, what happens, what I found, etc. And I just applied to the first one that it was mainly focused for international people but it was because I was afraid what happens in the first one. Mm -hmm. So, and next day literally they call me uh are you available and are not they send me a message are you available like that i was like oh my gosh it was so quickly it was so quickly and my fears start to appear my fears of my visa even they told me if it, there's like a special specify for for international my fear of english that i mm -hmm. still have it uh, my fear of um, I'm going to be enough to these positions. I don't, I has been like a lot of years that I don't, I'm not being occupational therapist, like I'm doing it for myself, but not in a company, not with another occupational therapist. Um, so there's a lot of fear to start. I, I, if I'm going to understand the call that they're going to talk, like make me, uh, am I going to understand all the vocabulary? That moment, all the fears start to appear. And I just saw them. I was like, okay, Eliana, let's do it. Let's do it. And I remember like when they called me the first one, I was like, breathe, Eliana, breathe. It's going to be okay. Um, 
<laughs> it's going to be okay. There's only one word that I didn't understand at that moment. It was case law. That was like, what? sorry, can you repeat me? Case law. Ah, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, and this was, um, when was the, the moment uh, that you came to the workshop? So you, you when you came in your, in your workday, uh, holiday visa, work holiday mm -hmm. visa, you went straight to Rockness. Uh, yeah, straight to the runs. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. after you left Rodness, when did you come to the workshop? No, it was before that. It was before that because yeah, it was really before that. It was like, and when I went to the workshop, I wasn't. I just arrived to Australia and I didn't have my farm job done. So ah, now things are making sense now. Okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so you went to the workshop, and then uh, when did you find the the, the uh, news about the workshop? I don't know where exactly i don't As know the job readiness uh, for migrant women or was there one with men in yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly it was like the city the starling city i don't remember yes, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh probably it was in a facebook group probably i'm sure in a facebook group someone because shared colombia probably i was there uh, making the the marketing <laughs> in the <Probably>. <laughs> yeah it's what i found it and when i saw like this is perfect for me i want to go there i'm going to take the five days to go there so that's the moment i didn't have i just arrived to australia um like one month <laughs> no Australia. no i believe it was self scanning if you did for was seed of canning that we one that went in Hillview? It was like mm, I don't have the date exactly to be honest. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it was the last ones. But anyway, so you went there just for women. And then I, I believe I remember because you when uh, I didn't have many people that came to Australia very early and came to the program. So it was a big surprise that say, hey, you just arrived. Wow, just arrived, yeah. <laughs> Important, the oh, good place to be right now. <laughs> so yeah. you came and did that, did the workshop. So how was the workshop for you then? Uh, it was really, really interesting. As I told you, like, um, I wasn't expected to have value information because the experience that you have is when you're free, you're not going to have like really like good information. That was my expectation, to be honest. But then the gay pass, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Mm -hmm. And I I become a marketer now out of that. <laughs> 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 like, like, go, go, go where there is really good, it's life changing. Go, go, go. And every time that I have the opportunity, I say to the girls who are in impaired, like, go, go over there because it's going to help you a lot. Yeah. And I imagine that um, the way you just, came to Australia as having a time from the moment that you had in France and coming to the workshop and learning, especially being in an environment that was just women, right? Yeah. And having the five days. And as I say, the first day, this is every day uh, that you are building your knowledge, gains more experience and knowing what you want to come to the last day when you wrap everything up. And how was for you then realizing that the last day, was a call for you yeah. <laughs> for me as I told like the last day was clear that gives me a lot of clarity and that's mm -hmm. what I needed it's not only that what you guys give me it's only what the other girls give me that's right the contribution exactly and so the reality is here in Australia so the importance to to try to build like in this because finding a job is it's not easy it's it's a it's a moment that is a lot of incertitude the more incertitude that you have already okay. <laughs> so it's really important to have a good community and even what also gave me that workshop uh i met one girl and she gave me she gave me a contact of another well that moment helped me was my one of my one of my first survival jobs here in Australia. <laughs> uh, you got one. <laughs> yeah, we are on the, on the hospitality. Uh, it was on the in that workshop. So give me a lot of stuff. Give me my first job in Australia. 
give me now the professional because all that I apply in my CV and my resumes, etc., is what I just get in the in the workshop. And I have the clarity where I want to go. I wasn't that crazy at that moment when I wrote everything that I want. And even that I'm the on the I'm just in the beginning of the way where I want to go. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I mean, I it was it, it has been like really interesting. I know this is going to be like I mean the like the beginning, but I really enjoy the process. I really like to enjoy the process and not feel like, oh my gosh, this is far away. What I want to be, because I want to be a PhD in the universities, be a, a, a teacher in the universities. That is exactly what I want to be. But it, and just the beginning, and just trying to understand Australia, the industry, how the company works, etc. So just enjoy the process. Enjoy the process, yes. And then uh, you mentioned to me before uh, that you had this um, moment that you could think about yourself in different situations in your life that you didn't stop to think about, but how you see yourself in uh, different times of your life. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah. How I see myself? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because through the workshop, you said when we work in the timeline, so uh, you said it was a good experience for you to see yourself in different times of your life. Yeah, exactly. Now I see myself one year after of that. Yes. <laughs> because it's one of the questions, how you see yourself in five years, why right? people don't know what to say, right? Because, yeah. and then in the workshop, you learn how to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I never imagined that in one year after I would be like, this so quickly it was so quickly but so quickly huh? <laughs> yeah. it was so quickly and kind of easy <laughs> yeah kind of easy right <laughs> that's a good one I'm quite of easy <laughs> like when you learn how to when you know what you want to do <laughs> exactly. exactly no but I I, I have a, I have a mantra mm -hmm. for me it's like for me I said in Spanish uh Lo que es fácil para los otros, lo que es difícil, what is difficult for the others is easy for me. Mm, okay, well done. Is how you see yourself. Yeah, it was when I, everything like, for example, oh, it's so complicated, it's so complicated. It's like, mm, could be easy for me. So for me in France, it was so easy to get the nationality, to find this internship. For me, all my life to find a job is having been like difficult. So have the certitude and the confidence that is going to work. Yes. And so, Eliana, you said before that you set, set to the 10 interviews. And then mm -hmm. if you didn't get a job with 10 interviews uh, or even job applications, you would give up. So how many job applications and how many interviews did you get? Oh, I can't have it. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> probably I said not too much eh? because I wasn't I don't I'm not the kind of girl like do, 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 do. no I just want okay that like it that like me okay I send it uh, probably six or something like that yeah six applications job applications mm -hmm. and I get two interviews mm -hmm. which they give me uh, offers that's a wonderful one. <laughs> and I got to choose. I was play no, not 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 playing with them, but I was like, okay, give me time because I want to hear the offer of the other one. <laughs> okay, now you do the you do rehabilitation, occupational yeah. rehabilitation. That's, mm -hmm. uh, so you came back to the therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad to that. I like that is the life. I even before arriving to Australia, I was like. In my head, I was like, I want to promote occupational therapy. I want to promote occupational therapy. How this career, like, saved my life, literally, the hardest moments. So, and I just arrived to Australia. And I every time that I say, oh, no, I just study occupational therapy. You're an OT. Yeah. What everyone knows what is an occupational Everyone knows. And that never happens to me. In France, not in Colombia. So life bring me brings me to a to a place without knowing <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that probably I have something 
I have to, I have something to to give, uh, mm -hmm. and it's going to help me what I want to 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 know to show about what occupational therapy can can help on the life of people, not only disability per person with disability, but migrant people also. Yeah. So there's some magic that we can bring as occupational therapies. Um, so yeah, probably God put me in this situation where like, okay, go over there and your message is going to pass through much better. And it's very interesting because uh, during my uh, period of working as a medical researcher, um, I was doing occupational health uh, in uh, migrant workers in Australia. Mm -hmm. research and one thing that um, I found with the uh, my my group working in this field is that uh, migrants they have they have injuries they have uh, uh, incidents but they don't report because they are so afraid of losing the job exactly. and becoming a burden for the company because they don't know their rights right so we'll be able to and then they end up um, killing themselves, mm -hmm. uh, working uh, with an injury uh, or not being able to work, but making all the effort to be there and not reporting. So I'm not sure if, because when I finished uh, working with that research was in 2013, and I'm not sure if things ha have changed in this uh, field regarding uh, reporting and I believe the time when they, we had the um, the claims for the, uh, how do you say, you said it before, um, they didn't collect the uh, account of birth. So we didn't know. Okay. So we couldn't measure that moment because mm -hmm. we didn't have this, this question uh, when they had um, this. Mm. So I'm not sure if they have included because it wasn't a thing that we um, suggested that would be much clearer for us to know in Australia if uh, newcomers would report more because in America normally we know happens uh, in Canada as well in Europe uh, does too but in Australia we didn't have, collect that data to be able to really say how about uh, the difference between the numbers of newcomers and old migrants and um, Australian uh, reported their uh, incidents mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. okay. yeah that is so true too fully agree with that is even that um every like I getting through the compensation now I compensation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you the, the claim for the compensation yeah, exactly. they like the data of uh counter of birth. Oh my gosh. So now I know everything of that and what I'm trying to do is like let it know uh, the closer people that I have here in Australia what are their rights, how they do it. Because it could be like physical like something passing an accident, but mm -hmm. they don't report it, but also can happen if, in a mental way. Because yes. as you told you at the beginning, like we have this tendency to give me more, give me more, or doing more, doing more to show up that we can do it because we, and we have the tendency, there I have a lot of girls that are in burnout in France, in Canada, and then starting to have it here in Australia. So there's a tendency that I, there even I saw like in the McKenzie study, the Latina girls in the United States, they have more this tendency to have a, like the burnout. Yes. So we have, because why? We, I want more this, give me more that. I can show you that I, that I can do it more. Ah, it's me, pro my processes, my pizza process, it depends on this word. So give me more, give me more, give me more. But it is, it's a, the, uh, what I call uh, the second class citizen syndrome. Uh, of migrants, uh, mm -hmm. they, um, migrants, they want to show that they deserve that job, that they can do something and they kill themselves uh, to the point that they get burned out with that situation, right? Working, working over, working over hours. And they don't realize that sometimes they are paying even to work instead of being paid for the work. And because they want to show, and then uh, it, there is always um I, I hear this always from uh the ethnic groups oh because of Brazilians you work um more than anybody else and Colombians come now because Colombians working more than anybody else when we may migrate oh because we Africans or everyone every migrant has this kind of attitude to work 
until they get completely burnt out, frustrated, and saying, and they don't see the end because this is the only option for them. And it's the second class citizen. And I say normally to them, you come to a country like Australia to be part of this first class citizen, but you behave as a slave mm. all the time. So true. Yeah. And then you don't see yourself as part of because you don't integrate yourself. You don't absorb, you don't, uh, it's not even absorb, but you don't um, immerse yourself to learn uh, what is the system, what is the culture, understand your rights. It's just the fear of if I don't do it, I will lose it. And that's what motivates a migrant. And, and it's sad until the point when they learn that it's not this way. They don't need to work this way. They don't need to behave this way. They mm -hmm. come to be part of what they want, but in the right way, as a first-class citizen. Mm. This is so know. true. Thank you so much for that, because it's so true. We need to, to change or where we think we were and now where we are and change this mindset completely because don't please don't wait until you arrive to the crisis your mental or physical health that make mm -hmm. a change and realize trying to change your relationship with their work but do it before preventive way always and i tell you Eliana, when i was doing research i i interviewed so many uh migrants and and it was something that I, I was very surprised because i could see part of me in all of them their stories the narrative i could relate to mine the point where I could see myself. But the, when I was doing research, I could not say to them, hey, stop, don't do it. Because I was doing research, I was collecting data. Mm. And as far as I could say, I was giving them some information where they could read something, but I could not intervene there. And that's why my life with research ended uh, basically in 2015, because I want to be more involved and help. Because I could not help uh, because of the conflict of interest. I had to collect data. I was not there to give the, uh, to make intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, was very difficult for me mm -hmm. that time because, but I was very uh, um, rich in that I, uh, information that I could collect to make my own decision where I want to be. I, wanna, I don't want to be behind the scenes. I want to be there with them. Yeah, that was a big point of decision, and that's why I, I I get your point when you you saw yourself immersed in that situation, and finding help and finding the meaning of your migration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and coming to Australia, and and looking yourself into yourself like differently, and approaching differently, uh, finding job, and if you want to stay. Is for different reasons. Completely, completely different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so, but tell me more about you got this job, and then how do you feel now? I just started last week. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> so I am still like a new learner. Um, how do I feel now that we talk about this? Uh, I just feel that every time that I have these fears. Uh, because I have to communicate a lot uh, with uh, health professionals and write a lot, uh, fears appear everywhere. So I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to be, I'm really uh, honest with my support. I'm glad you're not trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not trying. I'm, I'm, I am really honest with my team leader. Like, uh, and I say to them, well, this is what is what I'm, I think it's like something that I can improve, but I need more like more possibility to go more to the ground. Mm -hmm. I told him I'm a person of doing, I'm learning, I'm doing it, not like only theoretical stuff. I need to go to the ground, be with the people, understand them. It's, it's, I need to like get used to, to the Australian accent, etc. So because I know I told him like, I know that I have the technical st uh, skills for this job. I have it. And if I were in Spanish, hmm, I will be the best one. But it's in another language. So 
I have the technical skills, but it's going to take me a little time. So be patient with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and they install me in my computer. Like there's an special, a, a special like uh, features on the board uh, indicate that indicates me uh, my level of of grammar, except how I write in English. So it, it's it's on my computer. So for me, like oh my gosh, this is so perfect. <laughs> you got you an app to help you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and I have assistant. That Chat GPT is going to be my assistant. So I um, what I'm trying to do in my first week is continue to have my uh well-being habits before and after the job. Uh, I know that probably I also kind of start to have this tendency. Of, Give me more, give me more, give me more. So, no. I consider myself, as my friend told me, you're a very Australian. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand now what is being in Australia in a work day. <laughs> exactly. So, you're a very Australian. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's Australia. good. That's good because, uh, especially working with therapy, you need to take care of yourself first. Right, because clients and patients they come uh, full on to uh, share what they have, and not just to share, they want to give the load to you, <laughs> right? So, expecting you to solve the load, but uh, what we do is helping them to resolve what they need to resolve. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Well done. So, you know, what the plans for the future? Do you want to um, stay here for a while? Do you want to go back to Colombia? Do you want to retire in Colombia? Or do you want to go to Europe? <laughs> how uh, do you see yourself? No, moment, how do I see myself now? Like now, because I know everything can change. But now, how do I see myself in my future? Is in Australia, to be honest. I see myself in Australia uh, working here, uh, but as a consultant for myself and in love with the borders, uh, but also with companies, not really with, with workplace well-being. So mm -hmm. um, this is like, a, I call this job like a bridge for my open of opportunities. Um, so I see myself like that in the future. And I, for that, I need to develop leadership skills. So that is what I, when I that is when I, why I want it. Of course, what the procession of visa, visa, etc., but also that uh, this job is going to allow me because I know that I have this ability to get um, promoted so easy in the companies, to be honest. And I need to develop leadership skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I told this to when I applied to this job, like. I need to continue to be in a place where please that I, I, I that allow me to be innovated that if I have an idea can I, I can develop it uh, to have this freedom that I have um, so yeah um, this is how I see myself in the future mainly in Australia of course I have my heart all over the world <laughs> in Europe and Colombia uh, but I don't miss Colombia, to be honest. I miss my family mainly, and I sometimes, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I even miss France. I even miss more France than Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you really are missing the croissant. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot. <laughs> the food. I miss a lot the food. The food, right? <laughs> yes, it's so wonderful and. Um, you have been even uh, helping others with all the information that you got from the workshop you told me. So thank you very much for that. It's uh, it's wonderful when we can pass on uh, the learnings that we get to learn more when you teach others, so when we share what we know. So well done, uh, Eliana. So thank you very much for sharing uh, your, your uh, journey with us. What I'd like to ask you is, um, what a suggestion or advice would you give to someone who is outside of Australia, considering uh, coming to Australia for any reason to work or to study or to migrate, to live? Mm -hmm. What uh, kind of advice would you give to people, this kind of people? Um, that consider the fact to moving abroad, to moving to Australia as a project, uh, prepare everything, 
but even if you prepare everything <laughs> you prepared for the things that you didn't prepare for <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly and try to develop science now a lot of resilience uh and a lot of emotional intelligence that's that's something that i i developed in france that compared to deliana three months after migrated to france and three months after migrated to australia that is the life-changing emotional intelligence so that is really really important and try to find already if possible a community when you're going to arrive to australia that is really important community and emotional intelligence i think okay and if there is any other newcomer like you there in australia mm -hmm. uh, they could not find their feet yet so they are looking for clues or ways that they can find that job they are looking for or reconnecting with their career or transitioning or discovering a new, new career uh, they are not quite there yet so what kind of advice or suggestion do you give to them first of all think of the ask yourself why why you're looking that just stop just make a pause <laughs> stop and why you are looking at that what you're expecting of that search what is going to give you that job is that really what you really want to do that, that at this moment? I think it's that the main, like, because I can't give out, like, all the tips, except tips and tricks. You can't have it on the workshop. But um, stop and ask yourself, like, this is what I really want to do. Did I see myself, like, doing this kind of job? Or probably not. Or... Even if it does, okay, it's what is going to give you to your life, this this job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I will say that. Well done. So you said before that you miss uh, the food in France. What kind of uh, food um, do you miss or, or what's your favorite food, Colombian or French? Uh, my favorite, <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I don't know say that in English, um, escargot, uh, well. Oh, escargot, yeah, it's a cl yeah, yeah. Escargot. I understand escargot, escargot, I think there's no translation for that. <laughs> ah, really? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that, oh my gosh, I, lo I just love that, and the baguette, the real baguette. The real baguette. The real baguette. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that a lot, the possibility that you get down on the street, walk three minutes get the most delicious baguette in your and world they smell of the baguette right the red one like oh it's like a perfume in the air <laughs> yeah exactly i miss that a lot and i miss a lot the summer european summer in paris in august with the perfect one and do you miss any colombian food um yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's something that we call, it's a, it's a fruit, um, they call guanana, uh, and it's like, we put it, we made it with a, it's a Jewish fruit with milk, and it's like a kind of a milkshake, but it's a fruit. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, el jugo de guanabana. <laughs> guanabana. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's so nice. So, can you find uh, that kind of uh, fruit or milkshake here or even a, as a frozen uh pulp for the moment i didn't like look for that i re i'm already looking for for the french stuff and then i will oh. go for the <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> i see now <laughs> oh, <I care. laughs> good have you found the uh some swiss um uh bakeries here do you have some and that you can get the uh the baguette yeah. but you need to eat uh on the day and that's it it's a yeah, fresh I one know. the same as yeah so you can get some here in perth yeah i know i can find that <laughs> i already found it so that's, that's <laughs> <not good. laughs> you did your diligent work of finding it <laughs> well done so eliana thank you very much for coming and sharing your experience um and and letting people uh being a, um, a mirror to people to see that it's possible and and how they can do it because there are many uh, migrants out there, newcomers that they feel is stuck uh, with their decisions and they don't know what to do, what's next. Or even as we talk, they um, work themselves to the point that they burn out and they get frustrated. And some of them, they cannot cope with the situation and they go back home, right? Because 
they don't see how they can uh, move on uh, out of that situation. So thank you very much for your uh, contribution and for sharing your story. And uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, really, you, I'm sure you uh, do wonderfully uh, in your uh, work as a therapist again, helping people and putting together the rehabilitation, the occupation, the spirituality, uh, and well done. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you too. So thank you very much for watching um, the episode uh, here with uh, Eliana Duarte talking about her journey and remember to uh, subscribe to the channel just click on the little bell and get all the updates about the uh, premieres every week so see you next bye bye